Okay. Here we are. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. I uh, have to apologize for the situation that we had, <laughs> but it's, uh, we can look at this as a glass half full or half empty. <laughs> we're happy that we can sit here. And I'm um, very happy that I don't have to start today. They have a lot of things to tell you, really nice presentation. I just want to introduce to artists that I'm very grateful having in this gallery. So Pierre Fischer, painter, sculptor, lives wherever, I mean, France, uh, Italy, Poland, New York, and end up here since 2016, I believe, 14, 2014, six years. Uh, uh, and uh, Daniel Schenfeld Rodriguez, he moved from, I think from New York too, but originally from Venezuela. And he's an architect, sculptor, conceptual artist, amazing jewelry designer, amazing. <laughs> also and uh, that's all i just uh, want to welcome you and um, give you a microphone thank you thank you Andre. uh thank you guys for being here and uh, special thanks to the east hawaii cultural center to hang us and and especially about all andre best possible curator I have ever met. I mean, this guy, poor little fellow. Without him, none of this could have been possible. So thank you, Andre. Thank you. Uh, so I'll do my best to be coherent. So bear with me. <laughs> uh, so my name is Daniel Shankar Rodriguez. I'm an artist with a background in architecture and industrial design. Uh, I'm originally from Venezuela, uh, so when uh, people ask me, like, oh, how is Venezuela? There's uh, two images that come to me simultaneously. Uh, the first one is this one. This is Mount Roraima in the Amazon. It's one of the most magnificent uh, rock formations you could possibly imagine. We have the Angel Falls, we have... This is kind of like Hawaii uh, millions of years from now. And then at the same time, I get this image, which is our current reality. Uh, I know it's pretty strong, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but this is any given Wednesday for us in our city. So it's like, oh, how did you do today? Like, yeah, you know, uh, my brother got kidnapped, but yeah, he's back now, so we're good, you know? So yeah, actually that happened, and he's living in New York now. So that's, that's the contrast of images that come to mind when you ask me, what is Venezuela? No? Uh, to keep expanding, this is the city I come from, the, the city of Caracas. Uh, so within that contrast of images, there's an even, even deeper contrast. Uh, so Caracas, the best way I could describe it is some kind of uh, New York City inside of Waipio Valley. Okay? So if you've been to New York, you know how crazy, busy, chaotic it is, and then if you go to Waipio, you see how like amazing that, that formation is. So we have, uh, this is the Valley of Avila, we have the Caribbean Ocean, and then inside we have this crazy, chaotic city, uh, the city of Caracas. So if you see on the upper right corner, um, there's a division, a division which that contrast even gets deeper. It's within the city, there's another contrast, a contrast of the formal city and the informal city. The formal city is all the structures that you see in Honolulu or you see around houses that actually go through some sort of bureaucratic process to get permitted and some kind of have, have blueprints. And the informal city is the favelas or the barrios. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but it's uh, this phenomenon that happened uh, when too many people come to Caracas so to try to find a better life and work. And this happened in the time of uh, oil and, and the black gold. Uh, 
Um, so the amount of people is so incredibly high that um, this happens. This is uh, the Barrio Petare, the Scatia, and it's an incredible uh, phenomenon because um, all my life I grew up in the formal city looking at my surroundings, which is this. But when I started studying architecture, I actually had the opportunity to be inside this, and this changed my life. So. Uh, you'll see further ahead that this I consider one of the pivotal points of my career as an architect or artist, and even my personality is uh, highly influenced by this. Um, so at the same time, uh, when I was starting architecture, um, I had my first contact with the Bell's Woods, so I was in a, going through a architecture class, a history architecture class by this amazing teacher I have. And when I first saw um, the work of the Bell's Woods, which if you see this, this is kind of uh, pretty similar to that. Um, he worked with post-war architecture. So it's kind of like after this crazy chaotic disaster, he manifests uh, uh, this uh, architecture from it, from chaos. So, you could get stuck at all the suffering that comes from war, and war is nice, but if you get into a deeper understanding, um, this is kind of like a painting from uh, Pollock, let's say. Uh, you drop a little bit of painting and you don't know what's gonna come out. Uh, same way, that's the result of a city after war. You get this new landscape of man-made formation. Uh, so the Rose Woods was uh, <laughs> amazing at this, and, and this concept uh, stuck to stuck in my mind for, for, for many years. Uh, here on the bottom right, you can see more or less that, that contrast of the natural, the Avila, and then on the bottom is all these crazy favelas that kind of goes very similar to his architecture, even though he has absolutely nothing to do with Caracas or Venezuela. So uh, when I started experimenting with sculpture and also highly influenced by uh, architecture, I was obsessed with learning all these uh, softwares and computer uh, generating things and I started mixing technology with uh, art, architecture and later on jewelry um, to see where it could get me. So by having this, uh, uh, now that I look back at this sculpture with, I never intended to be similar to these tabelas, it kind of have a lot of connection with it. Um, so for a while, this was my brain. Uh, this is uh, parametric architecture, parametric design. It's just uh, connections of math, formulas that kind of plug together and create some sort of relationships and becomes these uh, forms, you know? So when I started getting obsessed by spending so much time, I was pretty much inside the matrix. And um, I started exploring like, oh, how's this math gonna get me these interesting things, you know? So then I started discovering these shapes, uh, parametric forms, until I got to the birth of 3D printing, which opened my brain even more. And it's like, oh man, now that I can manifest all these crazy shapes and they're not just the background of a computer, I can actually make it into this um, functional objects. So um, there's a long story and a more artist stuff to it, but I got into jewelry somehow. And this is kind of like an example of one of the collections that we have inspiring roots and vines. And this is a work in progress, which is a water-based collection where I actually manipulate the behavior of water and make it into jewelry by contacting um, uh, the fingers and hands. And it just goes to the shape of your body. Um, I also took this concept to collaborating with a builder in Puna and make it into a coffee drying structure with bamboo. So this software allows you to understand oh how how uh, long the bamboo needs to be and structural calculations, etc. Uh, this structure is in Holvalo. Uh And then I also took it to art, and this was my first. This is when I met Andre for the first time. This is the first piece I used for, for a show held in this museum and group exhibition. And it was um, an experiment with laser cutting and also using all this uh, parametric design. These sculptures can morph and fold and transform into different shapes. Uh, 
So now that you know a little bit about my background, I'm gonna dive into the series of, uh, of the pieces, uh, of the style of sculptures and pieces that, I, that I'm working on, and they're included in the show below. So the first series I'm gonna talk about is the ephemeral series. So from all this crazy chaotic place of uh, Caracas, I came to Hawaii, and I later on, I, I live on, off the grid for a while, and. Uh, I moved to the Kohala Coast, which was the best decision I've done in my life, but don't move to the Kohala Coast, okay? Um, so I started exploring um, the Kohala Coast and walking around and finding these amazing places. And um, then Pololu Valley became my background and suddenly I started experimenting making these driftwood sculptures. This is a, a, a sculpture that is still there. It's been there for about three and a half years. And I keep adding sticks every like, every time I come down. I also started doing some sort of sand graffiti. Uh, so when I come, I kind of feel the sand with different patterns so I can look how they look from the top. And um, same when I go to different spots. I always find the opportunity to manifest and create art. They might not be amazing pieces, but it's just simply the connection with uh, these uh, materials, especially uh, driftwood in this case. Uh, same, I started experimenting, like somebody uh, destroyed the land by putting a campfire, so then I started using that uh, eruption and, and make it into using the earth as my form to experiment with uh, concrete as well, like earth sculptures. Uh, and then I made things like this that I know that the winter swell is coming and this only lasts like three days and it becomes some sort of boat that goes to the ocean and, and explodes. Uh, this is the first project that I collaborated with Pierre and it was just using driftwood. We made some sort of portal and uh, we didn't use any nails, any ropes, anything. It's just straightforward driftwood. And uh, it was a great way to see how we work together and one of the reasons that we had this show as well. Uh, that's my kid, uh, he's a, a huge inspiration for, for my work and that's kind of, uh, this portal is aiming to exactly where the sunrise of this spot, which is one of my favorite spots. You can see the sun coming out and it aligns perfectly to the center of the sculpture. It just happened that it didn't last long enough for me to take a photograph, but at least I was able to witness it. <laughs> um, so then, uh, as well as, as the material wise, um, there's uh, an inspiration. I, I'm obsessed with uh, mythology and, and different, different spirituality uh, from Norse uh, to Greek to Hinduism. And um, for the piece of this series that I have downstairs, uh, the main inspiration was the, uh, the Norse mythology. So there's, this is Asker and Embla. Asher and Embla are the equivalent of Adam and Eve in Norse mythology. So for the Vikings, this was the first man and woman, and they were, Odin created them uh, from driftwood, and he gave breath to them, and then he brought them to life. So it's kind of like, a, it was a very interesting connection for me to see. And then if you get to see these Vikings that went from uh, Scandinavia all the way to Europe, and, and they had magnificent and building boats and temples using wood. And the translation of Aster and Embla today is ash and elm, which is common woods that we use for pretty much everything, and you can find them in driftwood very often. Um, so the piece downstairs called the Black Cube. I'm going to show you a little bit of the process. Um, so I. This was an impulse piece. I just had to do it. It's not like I really planned for it, but I just went and started collecting all this uh, driftwood, put it all together, and I said, this somehow is gonna work out. Uh, so then I got my, my helper to give me a hand, and uh, I used wood dowels to keep it all together, just to hold the form. And, uh, then uh, I went ahead and after I had this mass form of driftwood, I started giving the human shape. It's that we as men, as human, we always tend to find reason and understanding to the things that we see. So somehow this is my way of manifesting that modification, that interaction of man to nature. But the thing is that 
we can never control nature. No, nature will always prevail. So even if I try to make a perfect cube, it's nature will always overcome. So um, then uh, after this, I mean, also poetity is very interesting. Like while I was doing the show, we were working with Pierre. He comes from France. I come from Venezuela. Andre comes from Poland, and then you get to see all these driftwood pieces that end up in Hawaii, and all our cultures get meshed together into this new reality, and we become this new family. Um, so I've been also exploring with uh, soy sui divan. It's a technique work for Japanese architecture for siding to protect it, and um, I just burn uh, this this whole driftwood and unify it independently that they come from elm, ash, or koa. At the end, we're all the same. We're all part of one. Um, so this is a piece in the in the exposition below. Um, it was very I'm very thankful for the way that Andre was able to display it and uh, how he interacts with Pierre's pieces. Somehow, it's just a single spotlight uh, uh, illuminating the piece, and it's a gradation of the light into the darkness. And it, gives, it brings out that that you know that floating element of, of the piece, and um, this is kind of a close up. Uh, one of, one other interesting thing is that the glass, and that's how you uh, create the foundations. You elevate the river from the from the floor, and then um, um, you put you pour the foundation. So I started collecting all these concrete river dollies and I assemble it into this piece. This piece is called the visitors. Um, so in a way, um, the objective of, of this piece was kind of like how you can grab an element that is so cool and so used uh, commonly and so mundane for construction that it disappears inside the foundation and give them a, a new life. How can you give a soul to these objects? And, in the same line as um, uh, Arte Povera, a moment in Italy, giving life to, to mundane materials, they would use sculptures with shirts and things. And like, I try to create this conversation between these two towers. Uh, so in a way, a lot of it, after looking back, you know, I, I spent some time in Indonesia and we had the entry for the temples that create uh, these uh, view in, but at the same time, they're, they're so strong visually. Uh, cold movie from the 80s, uh, never ending story, and the things that try you trying to pass through. Uh, and then the Twin Towers, uh, which happens to be when you see the floor plan of the twin, twin Towers, they're slightly off and create a, a very strong tension. Even if they're just boxes coming out, there's a conversation between these two pieces. Um, and then there's also Tadao Sando architecture. architecture. Um, this project marked me from architecture school always. This is a church of light and a meditation space. So again, using a material that is so strong, so powerful, and you make it so sensible by just controlling the way light gets in. Um, so to me, that was the, the idea behind introducing the light. That's what gives the soul to the piece. And that's kind of like I'm trying to convey with it. There is this conversation and suddenly you look at it, it looks like these two beings uh, talking to each other. Um, here's a little bit uh, closer details of, of the stack. And one, one thing that is important to, to recall is that there's no, uh, there's no ties or anything. It's completely held by its weight. So one of the most important part is was like, how can I make these three structures completely self-sustainable and uh, self-portable? And um, and it's, I have to play with it, but I, I'm I'm happy that that, that it happened. These tubes and pour wax, pour concrete and this piece came to life. So uh, in a way, these are the, those earth core, earth, earth core tubes. This, this, build, this piece is called time capsule. And uh, it kind of like, you know, I just find it <laughs> super beautiful. It's kind of like subtracting history from earth. And there's these glaciers, or there could be these uh, silos, or uh, who knows what. And, and one interesting thing that happened by accident is by figuring out how to sustain it, 
I put a tension wire so they don't fall to the front and created this beautiful uh, shape pattern of uh, repetitive shallow that became a curve and gave some dynamism. At the same time, um, uh, one, only one of the tubes, I don't know if you got a chance to check it out, but it's the only tube that is dripping, so it kind of gives uh, tension to the piece and also gives the concept of time, of where the rest could get it. And also, I mean, you could uh, relate it to climate change, etc. So it's, there's many ways to it, but I just simply as a piece, I find it uh, beautiful and it's just simply this two material. Uh, so then for the, for the following pieces, again, going back to this mythology and this, these things that, that from a kid fascinated me. Uh, the, this is the, the story of Icarus. Uh, Icarus got his uh, um, uh, wings made out of wax, which is a material that I, I've been using. So um, somehow that, that, that concept of going all in and putting all your passion and going doesn't matter what the consequence is going to be, but I'm just going all in. If you know that you're going to fly to the sun and you're going to crash, then you do it. But hey, you got the experience of flying. Um, and then there's uh, the Leviathan and all this Behemoth, there's Shiva, all these gods of chaos and destruction. These are ways of us humans give explanation to these events that happen in, on Earth. And somehow we need to translate with our own experience. So somehow, I'm, I'm trying to capture this 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 same uh, essence, and um, also when the volcano was going in Kilauea, that was a crazy experience for me. I mean, uh, yeah, you see it on on the TV and stuff, but when you're there and you're listening to the lava crackling and you're listening, you see at 2 a.m. in the morning the lava hitting the water. Uh, it's an incredible experience. Um, so I was able to photograph it and get all these. Um, different understanding of the textures and one thing about lava is that it behaves very differently depending on the way that it cools down so it, when it aggressively hits the, the ocean it becomes ah it gets like too cold too fast it explodes but once it keeps going and going the temperature of the water warms up so it starts creating these softer softer pieces so I was like okay how can I mimic this how can I create this um, then that's when wax came in. Um, so I started melting uh, different uh, types of wax and dropping them in water. So um, when you drop wax in water, it creates these really random shapes. It's almost like alien looking like, and I was like, you know what? I got something going on here. You know, this was my first piece that I did and I was like, man, this there's, something incredible that, I mean, this is when I said, okay, there, this, this is the path that I need to take. Um, so in this same piece, the water started cooling down in certain areas, warming up in others, and the patterns were, uh, uh, that were created were very interesting. So I decided to take it to a bigger scale and started melting a lot of wax, which by the way is very expensive. <laughs> Uh, talk with uh, beekeepers, friends of mine that helped me out with a piece as well. And uh, then you can see here directly the contrast of the super organic with the architecture of like, hey, you got to make sure that piece holds together and you have this strong box and you have this strong frame. Um, so this is the form for two of the pieces downstairs. The right one is for the fall of Icarus and the left one is for the triptych, the mark of the Leviathan. Uh, uh, and on the left side, uh, there's this diamond plate. So the original idea was like, oh, this diamond plate is shiny and smooth. It's going to come out super smooth, but it happened to be aluminum. So when uh, there's some mix on the concrete mix, so I put a plasticizer and reacted chemically with it. So instead of making it super smooth, it created these crazy bubbles, which I actually love. Uh, so this is so uh, for you to see the, the process. You first start, you get, that's the void. And then you start filling it up with concrete and you add up with this block. And then after you get the block, you hope that the concrete went to the right places and stay away from the not so rice, but it's never the case. It's always a disaster. So you have to kind of like carve it away and slowly and be very patient. Um, and then this is for the other piece, the uh, Leviathan mark. You can see here the mark of the Leviathan. You can see here the diamond plate 
uh, didn't come out smooth, but actually it's like that bubbly finish. Uh, that's the wax. And then here on the right, I'm kind of like melting the wax away. So I get a, like people that have resources will put it on a kiln and melt the whole piece at once, but I just was with a little gun and it took me weeks to melt this wax away. Um, this is to show you the result. This is uh, the fall uh, of Icarus and this is the front and back and you can see the marks of the plywood and you can see the contrast between this very strong block element and this very organic void. Now the piece, the power of the piece is not in the wax or is in the block. It's actually in the part that is not there anymore. It's in the void. And this void is, it tells a story the same way as the landscapes of Lyle that you see around. Um, this is for you to see a straightforward shot of what's the positive and negative. That's, that's kind of like a, a the result. And also because I use jewelry, that's one of the reasons wax came. I actually use the positive to make the jewelries versus in these sculptures I'm using just the negative, the void. Um, another shot of the piece, uh, shot by Andre, amazing recapture. Uh, and this is a shot of the final piece of the triptych of the Leviathan Smart. So you can see the contours of the void and the diamond plate around it. Uh, and the last piece to conclude this, I hope you don't get too bored. <laughs> is this piece that even if it's very delicate, I'm, I'm really in love with it. Um, so a friend of mine gave me a bunch of jewelry boxes that were super ugly. And I'm like, uh, sorry, Mike. Uh, I'm, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna use this. Like, so I had them, I, I've been dragging them from one place to another and I had like 400 of these boxes. So I finally found the use. So I started creating, replicating this idea and just pouring little bits of melted wax into the water and then just uh, framing, the, the, grabbing this framing time of this, the, like what it looks like and variating the temperature of water and create like some sort of movement. This is kind of like, uh, this piece is called fragments and you can get the imprint of uh, different variations of, 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 of this uh, phenomenon. So the cool thing about this piece too is that the cardboard uh, of the box got stuck in the piece and when I sand it, I let it sit with it and created this marble-like look and it's almost like fossils, kind of like, uh, and it's accidental. And I think what I like about all these pieces is that I'm not looking to replicate a shell, I'm not looking to replicate a turtle or something, it's just like, you know, it's the, the beauty of the piece is the unpredictability, the uncertainty of what it will become and what it's going to be transformed. So I hope uh, you enjoy the, the artist stuff. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer all of them. And um, thank you for, for coming and listening. Anybody has questions? That clear, huh? <laughs> you know, it's going to be a minute. Hello, so my name is Pierre Fischbaum, and uh, yeah, how were you? When I was young. So first of all, again, thank you to Andres and the uh, museum for having our show and for Daniel to actually include me in that show because he's the initiator of the whole project. I'm going to try to drive you to my walk in here. And I have to go kind of a little bit way back for you to understand and pardon my French. 
So I was born very young, the fourth of eight children in France, and with a dad that was a theologian, so studying theology primarily the Catholic theology, but also comparative theology, meaning you compare different religions, and with a degree in uh, medieval history. And we grew up with no TV. So for me to entertain myself, I would go to the attic or places where I could find discarded objects, places of memory, places where you can create your own games or your own universe. And when I was at, uh, on ninth grade, I had an art teacher that teach me how to weld. So I started to make sculpture with whatever I would find at a junkyard or in the attic or the basement of our house. And this is also the time where I discovered the world of Carl Jung, which is one of the founders of psychoanalysis in a broader way than Freud, meaning that he created this a concept of um, of the archetype, meaning that in all all culture uh, all over the world there is archetypal figures that would come, like the mother, the protector, the warrior, and those things really struck me as a young uh, kid. So I started making those kind of sculpture with mortars, they would move, and this is all what I find without the junkyard of my dad's in the attic or in the basement. So there are those kind of sculptures using, again, some pieces of nature, old pictures, old photographies, and such. And so after a while in the, in my study, I started to be an illustrator. And at that time, I went for a pilgrimage in Poland. And we walked for 300 kilometers, which was pretty long, to see this uh, black Madonna. It's a sculpture that's really holy. A lot of people worship it of this black Madonna. And for me, after this three weeks walk, long walk, exhausting, my feet were full of blisters. To see this black Madonna was the holiest thing I've seen in my young experience. And for me, this became the the expression of the holiest. So when I become as a young professional, I was illustrator. I started to paint or draw all my friends as black to make them holy as well. So this is another of them, Eugene, this is another of them. And then I started in my early service to be a painter, to get away from the computer and also to try to express something that was deeper than illustration, because I didn't want the illustrator point, but let things happen and actually have something that you could experience that everybody can experience in his own way and not being only my own point of view. And I painted a lot of like volcanoes, nature. Uh, I'm not such a good painter that I can paint people because my illustration we are done on the computer where you have a lot of air to trace a picture and such. But if I try to draw a, paint, a, a, a person, it will look like a, maybe a bottle of wine or an old clock or I don't know, but definitely not flattery. So I painted a lot of monkeys. And uh, of course, monkey or man doesn't matter in a picture, it's just a figure. And going to there, I started entering in my mind and in my practice in some type of uh, mythologic time, a time before the man, where the concept of because so the religion was always in my mind in terms of uh, how do you create a mythology, how do you create a concept of creations. And uh, so I used monkeys and trees and nature to try to sort this out in my, in my own mind. I would make things like this and uh, things like that, which for me this was also already a volcano, which is also a mother. I don't know if I have a mouse here, but you can see. But for me, the volcano on the own eye that goes back to also my first sculpture where you had only an eye on the top of the sculpture is the eye of God, which is only one. The man of the duality, but the truth, if there is such, is one. So the truth look at you with one eye, and the man is lying down on the, on the ground under this. It looks scary, but actually she's a really nice woman. 
this mountain. And so that was my practice for 15 years until I, I, I moved to Hawaii. And those, this is my last painting actually. And when I moved to Hawaii from New York, Italy, and I, I went to New York uh, six years prior to coming to Hawaii, where I met my wife. And there was painting a lot of nature, but coming here, the nature was so great and strong that I could not paint it anymore. And I got stuck for three long and hard years until I met the chickens. Because in here, as you all know, we have a lot of feral chickens going around. And I walk outside and the chickens were all around my studio, pooping everywhere. And, uh, anyway. But I was frustrating and making such a bad art at the time that I say, well, let's give a shot to the chicken. And I had this, this piece of cardboard, uh, carbon paper. It's the paper that you use to double type, like you know, in the old typewriters, you had this for police report or whatever. And I was holding this piece of uh, carbon paper in my notebook for 20 years. I carried it around, it was from my grandmother's house. And I just lined this carbon paper on, the, on my notebook and threw some grain. And the chicken came and picked it and made marks. Made, made marks. And I developed it later using. I'm going to show you the process. I'm going to show you the process. So this is how they do. I built a template by wood, put my carbon paper, it's great, and they're going to make the universe for me, create the world. So, Often in art, actually, or at least in my practice, the result of a piece of art doesn't come from a clear understanding at first. It comes from uh, it comes from an, exper an experiment, and you you get dragged by a strong either an intuition or a strong desire or a material or a situation. And from it comes something that you're gonna start working to make sense of it. So the meaning comes second. The, the first is driven by a strong appeal or strong uh, intuition that of course is driven by your past experience, but what you see, the way you look at things. And coming from this theologian, no TV, low key background, I had a strong appeal for uh, vulnerable materials and also a desire for redemption for whatever is being put under or being not acknowledged as beautiful or holy. So for me, and also a sense of humor toward absurdity. And the fact that those chickens could create those round shapes for me, it was like the creation of the universe, because we come from actually a hazard. We come from, uh, there was not an, an, an intention, even though we make sense of it. The world happened, and the same as this happened. And for me, those chickens are creating a reality that I could take it as a base of a mythology. I could say, and say the first came the chickens. Or the eggs, we don't know yet. Right? Or after came the chickens, and the chickens created the world. And there we are. That was the absolute point of view of it. But there is a strong, a strong appeal that I still don't understand, but I keep doing it. And I could find yeah, a similarity in those microscope views for the map of the stars. So there is something cosmologic or cosmogonic about this world that appeals me and also really fragile and in a way absurd. So there were all the conditions for me to jump into that. So I started joining and playing with those shapes as the two sides of the moon, two sides of the universe, joint se sequence when you know the embryo starts from the separation of two cells. And so on. We see the most petri dish from growing bacteria and such. 
with a little detail so you can see actually how amazingly and accurate the chickens are. They are great painters, greater than me, for sure. Those are just the shape of the clothes because they usually scratch to get the birds and such. All right, this is the next work that I'm presenting down at the show, which came after the chicken prints. I was at Home Depot, that as Daniel, this is, I think for most of the guys, this is our toy store. <laughs> and uh, I just noticed a pile of tar roofing paper that was left on the pallet outside. And all the sides that was exposed to the sun were bleached. And I was wondering if it was from the rain or from the, from the sun. And I kept this in my mind and played around for maybe a year and a half until one day I went to Manoloa up the observatory, observatory road and it's pretty far high. And I just lined a long strip of this tar paper and light stone on them and came back three months after. This is the result of the. So this is the tar paper that's been after three months and when I come to harvest them, you see that every piece that's lying on him or on them are printed in black. And for me, what was interesting then beside the visual aspect and the excitement of the child is you have to remember that the play of a child is a really serious business. And children don't play as we see it as an adult, as oh, they're just playing. They are actually shaping their world. And as an artist, you play with the seriousness of the child. Okay, and so this is this is actually what appeals you and brings you to a process that you will later try to make sense of. So this is the process of the tar paper. I'm going to try to go back to my Yes, the time you can breathe. Right. If we are there, I'm going to go back in the past to there. So this is also another example of the tar paper. Like when first I laid it, and three months after, I also bleached. This is the piece that's at the museum downstairs. And it's just a combined piece of two tar paper. One was made with rust, rusted piece that actually I found with Daniel in Havi. That was part of a wheel, a huge wheel of machinery. I don't know if it was a mill. It was made of a lot of layers of this crested, you know, like I don't know how you call it when things crunk together, you know, these kind of things. And I just laid them on the on the tar paper for three months and they got this rust coming into the tar paper. And they can be combined and look like a scheme. So I start thinking of this medieval history of those Lasco cave paintings or those native uh, Indians that would paint on the bison skin. And because it had this kind of intriguing quality and uh, features of an old a timeless type of uh, artifact. And I also like the fact that in this thing there are stripes. And stripes, this is the one that also before it got bleached. So because those walls were used before we were making books in the oldest form of scripture I and mean, after the tablets, cuneiform tablets of the Babylonians, we had either the Chinese historical walls or the Dead Sea uh, scrolls that we found, or the, uh, this is a medieval scroll as well, or the Torah. And in there, there is, especially in the Torah, and they still do it now, how they hold, how there is this relation to God and history through these scrolls that, unlike a book that you flip the pages, it's a continuous strip of history. And I like these things with the, the tar paper 
the fact that it's a history, it's a remains of something that's bleached by the sun and by time it gets removed to the bleach. And I'm still figuring out, I mean, I'm still really excited about it, so I haven't still drained it, you know, I'm just keep experimenting it, but you can really combine them. And I started combining them like this kind of things where you have a, Door, it's, the thing is actually just a little bit, it's pretty difficult to do. Anyway, this is another type of combination of them. Those are with the car, car tires. Because what I use is I use either lava rocks, whatever I find on my way to Manoloa, which is mostly broken cars, tires, and this was painters, the, the human body was just painters uh, all over. Close that were right there. Next book that's down at the show is the, the lava pieces. Going to Manoloa a lot, I started collecting little pieces of lava that really in, intrigues me or appeal me as they look like fragments of uh, archaeology. As I told you, my dad was had a degree in medieval history and he brought me to uh, archaeology. Arch archaeological digging, or sometimes we do restoration of old monasteries. And I remember going and dusting out those little fragments of pottery or, or such. And so I collected over three years in Manoloa those all those different fragments of lava that I want to display almost as the remains of a, of a civilization because they seem to be made with a purpose. And they all have a, let's say, not man-like man uh, attributes. Because man often project, we have a kind of a big ego, we project ourselves in nature, and whatever else, too old, we see two eyes, and we have this anthropomorphic ability to project ourselves into things. And when I came up to Manoloa, I, I found this, and you'll find, you understand later, and the, I'm going to show you that all those elements I found in the island that was I had nothing to do with them had already all the features of a coherent world that I was trying to grasp or understand or make sense of it. So those are all the pieces that I found that you can see look almost like Neolithic uh, arrow heads or blades. All of those pieces that are to be from the, from a lava cubes also up in Manoloa, that were extremely similar to those type of pottery we find, like old Roman pottery. Those two, they, are, they just look amazing to me. The, the defined uh, design of nature and the aerodynamic, the shapes, the shine. So again, kind of the space size play. Next we're gonna move from lava to fern, because the fern is one of the first plants that grow into the lava. And from that type of fern to the Akuni fern, to the Akuni fern that grow mostly a little lower, but a lot in Karoko, where I live in Hosanoa and it's not far from. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope you guys understood. Anyway, to the Akuku fern that grows in Kaloko forest. And I go hide there, and one day I found uh, one of the dead stems on the ground, on the floor. And I saw all of a sudden faces looking at me. All those little faces that you see there are actually the base of the branches that would grow, that when they fall off, the old stem would fall down and get completely hollow and empty. So I start collecting those root ferns for a while. You see how nice and friendly they are. And some of smaller ferns that also have body attributes, so they look like, I don't know, sculpture or body to me. And start assembling them together with pieces of lava I found in the uh, in the Manoloa, and together with uh, sheep uh, poop, because I have sheep in our farm, 
And actually, I found their their food really a beautiful, beautiful thing. And again, I like to give a status to discarded things or humble materials. And I saw that they were kind of actually they are really good fertilizers, so we should value them as kind of a black gold. But not many people see them like that. So I use them in my sculpture, trying to create those spirits again with this apple fern that you know making idols or spirit or those reduced heads you have from the what is it called? The reduced head you have from the Navajo. No, not from the Navajo, from the uh, what is this? I forgot now. There is those people that reduce skulls and make little heads to keep the spirit of the living and make little uh, idols or you could say Bodu, but Bodu is a different approach. So it's just start making those the small spirits of those people. And the material in the back is this apple fern uh, fiber that I think the Hawaiian was using to uh, sponge the fluids from the body when they were embalming their dead for burial. And then also some uh, feather from birds that keep banging in the window of my house and I find them dead. Mm -hmm. So I have to use them and put them in the way I them back. So those are all of the smaller spirits that I made just from the head. And this you see all the sheep dogs around to make them all the beautiful. And a rock. I always have like eight pieces of a rock because those I think those spirits are feminine spirits and they are all protecting a rock, which is a bit more masculine and always smaller, but like stuff and strong. And this is a rock I found in Manoloa, something like that. And it really looks like a skull. Those are some examples of African also spirit of uh, spirit and sculpture that could relate to this to them. This is from Nepal. And then I did also from this same series this uh, long guardians sculpture, which this is a whole whole fern roots with just a head on the top. But actually, for the Hawaiian, the, this fern was the physical body of Amawa, which is the or Amaya, Amaya actually, which is the mother of Pele, and she's also the guardian goddess of the island of Hawaii. And again, I didn't know this at first. This comes after I made my sculpture and tried to research what material and such, and I did into the history of the plant and acknowledged that it was also the goddess of fertility, which is what I saw it in first. I saw it as a motherly figure with so many babies attached or coming or sprouting out of her body. So I put them on tall poles that made them look upon me like garden figures. And I use as a base all the, again, car parts, whatever I find on my way to Manoloa, which is mostly actually car parts. Again, the beautiful little people and their tools. And this is, this is a sculpture I grew up with. It's a sculpture of Saint Anne from the 14th century, it was in my house. And it also dragged me at first because I, I've seen this all my childhood and I always loved this sculpture because it's big enough, it's almost destroyed but really holy and has a strong, uh, strong spirit inside and that people would, would not recognize at first because it's really humble material, her face is almost discarded and she's carrying this uh, daughter which is the Maria as a child and the book as a motherly figure of trying to teach. And this was for me really related to those uh, French sculpture and again related to Carl Jung, the fact of those uh, those archetypes that are cross civilization, cross culture, it doesn't come from a specific set of uh, theology or specific culture. Then after that, after this installation, I'm going to move to the cook curtain. So, as I have a lot of cook, I have a lot of sheep, I have a lot of cook. And the coffee season was over, so I just keep picking 
put in stress coffee and let them dry. And uh, I decided to make a curtain out of it because I find them beautiful and I want to show people how beautiful they are. But also I know that it can be a scary material and a curtain is meant to be uh, passed through. And passing through a curtain of poop has, requires a lot of humbleness. But this is the only way to get to something bigger, is to go to get small and get brave and just go for it. And actually when I was a child, that's my aunt's house, I lived there for a year when I was two, three years old, she had this curtain in her kitchen. Um, it's a whole um, made house, kind of hippie-ish. Um, you go through this curtain to go in the kitchen, which was my chapel 16, because the whole kitchen was made with those, this is nowadays, so it's 30 years later, it was all made with those pictures of skies and it looked like a church for me. It looked beautiful and you have to enter through the curtain. So for me entering the curtain, was these things, and actually the curtain in the Temple of Salomon, the Holy of the Holy was behind the curtain of the Temple, and only the High Priest could go behind the curtain, meaning what the truth is always hidden behind something that you have to go through. And in this case, it's a curtain made out of 1360 and 25 sheep dung. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Anybody has any questions? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Go for it. So how we came up with the concept for this exhibition and how we came up to work together? It's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, um, I, I, I've been wanting, since, since I first saw this space, I've been wanting to do a, a show here. Yeah, I mean, as you witness, it, it's, a, it's an amazing space. Um, and then uh, talking with Andre, uh, kind of like hinting like, hey man, I'm kind of interested in doing a show. What does it take, you know? And uh, so to make a, a, a strong art show, you gotta come up with a, with a good plan. Like you cannot just like, oh, you know, I'm gonna put an orange painting here and this and that. So you kind of have to elaborate a thing. And um, this kind of uh, somehow, I, I really don't know how this came out, but it kind of makes sense that like we started like having coffee and brainstorming on different ideas, but somehow a constant was this idea of ruins, uh, temples, uh, uh, things that happen after <laughs> humanity gets destroyed or who knows, and this happens way before everything that is going on right now. This is, I'm talking about months ago. And um, so we kind of put it together and came up with this with this concept, Remains. And uh, the interesting thing is that it's not like, oh, Pierre, I, I've seen your sculpture. I think it goes well with, with my stuff. Like we haven't really seen much of our work aside from uh, his painting. And then we had that first experience doing the Driftwood sculpture together, but this was like, rolling the dice. But the, the, the magic thing of this whole thing is that independently, I mean, I think the first time we saw each other's pieces was the day that we brought him here to the museum. And uh, the biggest challenge was like how these contrasting <laughs> artists can come together. And that's when I think like the vision of Andre, like I'm not, like I'm really honest when I say this, like it could not, would have happened if Andre wasn't present. I mean, like Pierre and I, like, hey man, let's put it together. Like, I don't think we're. Yeah. For me, I, Daniel told me, like, yeah, let's try to have a show 
they um, I was doing painting and those, none of those. I mean, I had already a chicken print going on, but that, that, was, that was pretty much about it. But the idea at, at first was we acknowledge that we are both came to this island from different cultures and we wanted to show somehow how we can show a different vision also of what we see around, what's our reality, how is our vision embrace can embrace this island somehow, even though it's not only related to the island, but it was to have a different perspective onto our vision of living here in a while. And somehow ended up working with raw material like Daniel is concrete and V Watts, which actually I believe Big Island is the biggest producer of the Queens for all mainland the Queens V comes from here, most of them. And for me I ended up working with Lava Shipboard and so it was a it didn't came from a inten intentional idea of working with the same material, it just we kept talking through the process and we acknowledge that we work with pretty much black and white materials, raw materials, and at the end can came up with something that is pretty complementary in the vision. And I think his work give good uh, place to my work and my work give also a good place to his work. And balance pretty much each other. And actually, I, I, I just realized I forgot one thing, which is the video. You know, if I just I just speak one minute about it, it doesn't even show us. And very straightforward and very good. Thank you. This is the last piece that was in the show. That I put. Yeah, that I put in the show. It's a video of Kohunki Beach that I took every year with my wife and children and my son. We meet at the uh, we used to meet at Pohuki to see the sunrise. It's a Japanese tradition. Instead of partying the day before, you wake up actually really early and go and be there for the sunrise. That's the first thing we do for the year. And so we've been there for years and it used to be cliffs and we had the hot pond and you know. But this year when we came, it was a beautiful sun beach. And I start filming the beach with the phone. And when I went home, I looked at those footage, and it looked for it looked to me as a volcanic eruption because the foam I can show you there. The foam is really white. The sun was really black. And actually, this is the last creation of the volcano. And so the volcano created the beach, and then the sea erodes the land and shaped the island. So actually, the volcano is an act of creation. And the uh, sea is a tool of destruction, self destruction to some extent, to the man's land, let's say. So I just present, I just flip the video and present it as an eruption to show the connection between this always going circle, cycle of creation and uh, erosion and creation of erosion that actually shaped our island. I'm done with the show now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. If there is any more question. Uh, more, more of a, a comment that uh, when you were talking about, for example, the history of the Earth, you were talking about the control in history when you were uh, and just struggling with how similar. <laughs> uh, probably this doesn't help either. Um, I was just struck by the core samples, the history of the earth, and the series of that. And then you were talking about showing pictures of the scrolls. Yeah. Same shape history of mankind written on the scrolls and it just struck me as uh, a very seamless concept that I really love that. Nice accent. Yeah, nice accent. <laughs> you know, a lot of things in this show yes. came, yes. came right as this also like the 
Daniel is briefly confused, that's yes. burned and charred in that room where there is a volcano. He's also saying it's a driftwood that comes from the sea, soaked with water, pitched by the sun. That gets burned as a lava thing. So he's bringing again the sea to the volcano. And then bring the volcano to the sea. And then yeah, many okay. of the pieces work together in that sense. Yeah. Same with the yeah. sound of the ocean, or tumbling, the drift of tumbling in the ocean, but it kind of gives a whole new perspective. So, uh, seemingly static piece, it kind of gives movement that just brings in the movement of the background. We actually witness a piece from the back looking at the video, and it kind of makes a lot of sense, but it was never planned. So, often, I guess, often in art, when you're open and just walk in and don't think too much, things happen. Magic happens in a way. I don't want to put the magic whatever in there, but I witnessed many times good things happen when you're open to them. And uh, we have pretty good friends when we walk like really seriously on our stuff, and somehow there is a type of alchemy that happens. If you allow them to happen, if you don't try to frame your work too much, if you let it come and just witness your material and try to bring them to a place where they will be seen the way you look at them, the way you see them. The intuitive part that yeah. really connected you, um, kind of the mystery that was working with it was just a really present thing. And I, I think the name Remains was really. Um, what I thought was really amazing was, and I see this theme kind of coming up outside of the show too, is how important it is when you have an intention behind what you're trying to create, and then realizing that what Pierre just said, the magic happens when you submit, when you surrender to the things that you can't control, right? So you just kind of have fun with that. So having learned that, that seems like to be a lesson and a theme that goes into this work, and into what Pierre's work. Um, how does that shape your work going forward, having learned what you do? Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, looking back to me, that's pretty much everything. That's, that's kind of like the most important thing. And it's also looking at my kid. It's kind of like that carefree, out of constraint, full potential, let it come type of thing. The, the beauty of the chaos, which is kind of what I was talking about. I mean, even when I, I try to frame this this talk as to things that make sense, but it's not like, oh, I did this job, this work because of that. It's kind of like, oh, now that I look back, that had a huge influence. So it's this uh, kid-like mind where it's a challenge. It's like you grow up, you learn all these techniques, you learn, but but the piece when you try to do it, you try to. That's when I was saying like. You try to do a turtle and imitate it exactly as it is. You'll, you'll never get even close to the essence. But if you actually manifest the essence of the turtle, and you just let your heart speak for you and see what comes out. That's where the beauty comes out. So same with like the chicken scratch. I don't want to talk for you, but to me that, that piece is very attractive because of that. It's like there's no way you can control that. It's the chicken who's controlling this, you know? So it's let the universe create. And that is what I think that what, what you're talking about. If I came to realize when I held a piece of wax after melting the water, like I gave in to whatever comes out. It's like, uh, who knows what this will come in? And this is just the beginning. So yeah, that definitely is place, if not the most important part of this whole thing, at least for me. So I would I would say also that we are not that smart, and uh, we are not that smart. <laughs> often, if we stick to our ideas, we, we just go to the wall. So we, we have to be good eyes, good hands, 
and pretty humble and just have a really strong trust in the intuition or practice. Of course, everything takes, takes practice, takes a lot of practice, takes to be open, a lot of mistakes, try to make sense of those mistakes. But pretty often, I worked in advertising for 15 years and I've seen the damage of having an idea and trying to illustrate it. It turns into commercial which are really pretty for broken. But a piece of art is, works in really different ways. It creates questions. Like, for example, when I was making my painting at first, people would ask me, oh, so what is that? And then we tell them the story. Like, they like because I always make stories in my head. So this little guy is here because he came from Zilis and blah, blah, and such. And uh, actually, people would relate to it from a completely different angle. And I, understood how to shut up and talk it out. <laughs> but because those things when when you do them actually in a really open way and when there is a little tingling feeling you know when you're right. You know when something is right. It comes also from practice, from excitement, from something. But it's right also when it's open and when it can become the when somebody else can own it. I mean really own it and make it his own and make it part of his life. So I think often things come from this attitude, like don't force it. Try to understand what you do. Don't force it into your idea. Be open to be amazed at what's, what's going to happen. So I, I say experimenting is extremely strong. It's extremely important. One quick thing is uh, to add is that even if you see the success story behind it, there's a lot of failure. There's a lot of like uh, trying to make like, yeah, you give in, I give up to the universe and I came up with this terrible thing I don't want to see ever and it's up in the garbage and I just wasted $500 on material. So just don't get discouraged as well when you go in and it doesn't go the way that you expect. And always make sense of your trash too. Don't trash too much. <laughs> um, it's just an observation of um, Pierre's work, how the Black Madonna influenced in your life, how it carried on through all your phases. It, it, it was your pre predominant palette was black. Um, even through the chicken face, I just kind of happened to notice that. So, yeah. Good day. Good. Papa, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to tell you a um, secret, kind of. <laughs> So I, I noticed there's an interesting theme of, uh, I don't know if it's the past or the future uh, when I look at both of your works. And um, I guess with society sort of gently crumbling right now, I guess my question is, was there any intention to reference that in the way of this being a vision of some weird, uh, you know, sort of past timeline or more like a future timeline where we, you know, walk through the curtain of sheep dung and worship the concrete and commune with like the chicken prophets. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's actually something that um, after the apocalypse started happening, we're like, man, what, what have we done? You know? <laughs> so when we first kind of like draft this, the plan for this show, like, okay, came up with the words like, oh, romance, it's about this, this and that. 
and I send it to a few people and just happen to send it. Well, this is going on. And they look at me like, man, that's like super dark. And it's like, <laughs> and I was like, oh man, yeah, I, I kind of didn't tie one another. This was more like, I always been curious about it. And I always see that this is a pivotal thing that could happen to humanity. And again, when you see all these wars and all these things, that's something that I've always been curious about as to, you know, like how we have such a potential for creation, but we're incredible at destroying as well. Um, so to answer your question, we, we did not relate it directly to what's going on. It just happened during the fact. So we kind of started moving the motion. And then when we were about to release the show, it's like, oh, by the way, it's pretty pertinent to what's what's going on. So that, that's kind of what, how, how we play. Yeah. I would add that at the beginning, we are, especially for me, walking in uh, Manoloa, it's pretty high and there nothing lives. I mean, there is actually some goats because I, I find poops, but they are white. <laughs> that might be for the next walk. <laughs> but, uh, we had already, we are talking about this kind of Mad Max post or pre-apocalypse or something because also what I find there is actually wrecked car, junk pieces, discarded stuff. I've never, I've never seen another human being on those lava flow where I am. Actually, what my kid was telling me in my ear is tell them about the one mile lava tube because we go there and also I can find lava tube that goes for mile in the mountain and the whole top of the lava tubes looks made out of metal. It's an, I brought Daniel there and he's seen this. And maybe some of you have seen those uh, more recent lava tubes that are really shiny silver, dripping, really smooth. And it's like you're inside the gut of some type of alien monster or something, you know? And so there was, from the fact of choosing materials as a fern, at least in my end, at fern, lava, and such, something where the man was abstracted from it, was not present. The beings, actually, the people of this civilization would be the fern people, the lava would be their tools, and the beach is their volcano, and such is like the man is, was maybe there, or will, so it's true that it's it's just a coincidence that it happened with the world now that maybe people can see it maybe with a stronger eye or relate to, to it in a different way. But yeah, there was an intention at first to show a post-civilization time, kind of. Just one quick thing to add is, uh... On the images that we sent to present about the show, one of the reference was like the Stonehenge and some sort of like, you know, you go to the Rapa Nui and you see these things that are perfectly oriented somehow, but you're like, why they were made or what's the real intention? We can assume all we want, but we never met straightforward with that civilization. So that's kind of what the inspiration also was, kind of like, what if we make this show where there's all these things that people come, check them out, and have no idea why they were made or why they're there? So that's 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 how it went. More. Any more questions? I just have a very simple question. Do you both have hope? I have hope. I have hope. I mean, even what do you have hope? What do you hope for? But yeah, I have hope that uh, art can still help the world, at least heal or understand. Um, Maybe like if we have less job, maybe people might have more time for art and farming too, because we still need to eat a lot. But I have hope because we this is not new. I mean, what's happening currently is not new, and uh, actually it can 
It can also help us focus or try to shape a reality that was out of our end before to some extent. And uh, at least as an artist, I don't have hope in the art market or make a living out of it, but I have hope that there is actually a good need for art right now. That is a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, I, um, I mean, I, I, every time somebody asks me, like, how do you see yourself five years from now? I, I can't stand that question. I'm not yours is not the same. I'm just saying, looking in the future, it kind of displaces me into a time zone where I transport to it too fast. And suddenly I feel that because I make that connection, I'm going to travel way too fast. So these five years are going to pass in a second. So I, I do my best to stay here. Okay? So when it comes to do I have hope, um, it's more like how do I deal with that feeling? Yeah, um, as, as I show you, and I, I was very brief about it, I, I passed through many years of, of, I mean, right now it's been 21 years of, of oppression in the country that I came from, right? If you have hope that we're going to get out, you know, it's kind of like such a difficult question. It's more like, how do you deal during these times? And because we're human, we try to say, put time to that hope. Say in five years, everything will be okay. Like, that's, that's what I think. I try to step away from time, transform all these feelings, all these frustrations, all this love into and put it into my work and try to forget about any reality but the one that I'm doing at that moment. Um, so I could say, yes, I'm, I'm hopeful, but it's more like um, I'm handling hope in my own way. That's that's how, how my answer would go to that question. Um, so it just seems like you guys are both very in tune with your emotions, and I was just wondering, during your entire process, did a certain emotion come up that was unexpected, like creating? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, that's tough. Uh, I don't know. I mean, for me, as you see, it was a complete change of practice from years of painting and also friends. Because most of most of my friends are also in Europe or Italy or certain used to my older work and I couldn't speak about what I was doing because I had no idea to be until pretty close to the show what anything would be. So if I would say something, it would be that actually these things renew, reconnected me to when I was 16, 17, to the beginning of my work and renew my faith in actually just trusting, trusting the, pro the process and the practice. And so it's not a new feeling, it's just a renewed feeling in this trust that even if you have no idea what you're doing, keep doing it and something's gonna come up. So yeah, that could be it for me. That's also a great, difficult question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can say that this has a goal all kind of emotions for me and I can say that this is the greatest thing I've done in my life. Um, I like uh, yesterday I saw my brother send me a video that somebody random sent them to him that it was from a concert he did when he was 15 years old and um, in this video when the camera is going and this person really didn't know any of us my mom appeared in the middle of the video. My mom passed away when I was 21. And just that moment, it kind of connects me to all this feeling. It's the only video I've seen of my mom. Like, I, I've seen pictures, but I never seen them like smiling and moving. And it was like really shocking. And this really transformed me to, from childhood to all kind of emotions. So 
and, and, and somehow I kept connecting it to all these pieces that are being created. And um, it's all emotion. It's, it's nothing but. Uh, you ask us why we did this show. It's not to sell pieces, it's not to get famous, because we really have to have a way to transform all these emotions that we have in us and make something. It's uh, what kind of emotions is every single emotion I have it was evolved during these pieces. And, 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 and I, I'm happy to, to say that they really reflect a lot of what I've been going on and and it's a great way for me to to travel through this whole <laughs> time lapse. So it's kind of a yeah it's I pour my emotions into these pieces so everything about it is every single emotion I have. So an awesome question. Right now. Hello question. <laughs> Maybe one more. Um, I just want to say um, that um, since we got this proposal, written statement with some samples, there were some pictures of, <laughs> of there were some pictures of of um, Pierre's work. So not only the scratches. So when we got the proposal, I think about December, we went through our we were because I came back to the center in October so when I came here we didn't have a program now we have but um, when we got the proposal and went through our advisors and we decided uh, so we met in January so this show is done in five months all this I mean especially the concrete pieces that take so much time to, to, to process so so I'm so grateful that um, when I joked that there were emotions, there were because of that too, a little time and and I really appreciate, I really would, I would like to thank you both that uh, we made, uh, you made and myself a little bit to put the effort just to push you <laughs> to, to have this amazing exhibition. Uh, so thank you both and thank you all for coming. I'm really appreciate it. Thank you. So I had to water it, let it dry. That's what I wondered if you had to water it. Uh, I had to control it because uh -huh. it would just burst into flames in a second and disappear. So, like a motion effect? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> we were happy. Okay, yeah, I wonder, yeah, because it didn't, you know, kind of yeah. disintegrate, but it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, just the very nice show I've seen here. Thank you. I've been coming for years. And I just so. Thank you. I'm well, so inspire, I mean, just. Um, you did it for all the right reasons, yeah. which the integrity was just so perfect. And the concept of remains, just, I looked at all of them through the events, and, uh, and I thought, wow, the consistency of the concept, the materials, it's so original. Yeah. And I just, yeah, it's oh, really, thank you. thank you so much. I'm so glad you live here. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hello everyone, is that 
concludes the um, artist talk with Pierre and Daniel. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, you know, you test things during the day and everything works out and then you never know. So that's just what happens. Um, this is our first time streaming, so hopefully in the future we'll have things a little bit more uh, prepared. But um, I guess that's that. So the whole stream, I, I believe because I had to actually switch phones, is cut into three different parts. I'll check on that later. If there's a way for me to save them and combine them into one, I'll do that. Um, so unfortunately there will have been some chunks possibly missing, um, but I will do my best to try to make it one long continuous piece and I thank all of you for coming online, joining us, and we will see you again on the next, next one. Alright, thank you. Bye.